finally recording. Thank you for for joining the the hangout. I really appreciate your time. So, yeah, thanks for asking. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here with Hugh Kretschmer, and he is a photographer and an artist. And today we're going to talk to him about his process. So, Hugh, if you don't mind, I'm just going to jump straight into the questions. Absolutely. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. So, Hugh, how would you characterize the art and the work that you do? Uh, how would I characterize it? Um, well, it is... Uh, I think it's more than just photography because it involves a lot of craft that I actually do myself. Um, I have a tendency to go with in-camera techniques and uh, plan my shoots around that. So it's a little bit of assemblage. Um, it's concept. It's assemblage. It's collage. Um, it's some photography. And then, of course, some digital retouching at the end. How I put that all together in one description or one label, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But um, that's what's involved. So, um, How did you originally get into your art or your line of work? Uh, well, my father uh, was an engineer for McDonnell Douglas, and he worked uh, for that company uh, from, the, on a, from the Mercury through Apollo missions. And he was a photo instrumentation engineer. And he got that job basically because the government was throwing all sorts of money towards that goal of putting a man on the moon. And he developed that, that particular department at McDonnell Douglas. And as a result, he had all sorts of equipment that he had accumulated through that process. And he had this amazing lab in a bomb shelter in our home that uh, he it was uh, in our family there were seven kids and it became this kind of rite of passage where he would take each of my siblings I'm, I'm fifth out of seven take us into the dark room have us uh, develop our film and process our prints to see if any one of us would grab onto that uh, onto photography and I think basically my dad was uh, trying to discover or find someone in the family he could talk to about this stuff. And when it came down to me, I was the only one basically in the family that grabbed onto that. I was hooked. As soon as I saw my print come up um, in the fixer, I was, you know, or the developer, I was actually hooked. And from that was when I was 13 years old. And... Um, from then on, I, that's what I wanted to do, and I had their, my parents' moral support. I majored, it, majored in it in high school. Um, I went to Art Center College of Design and you know, started my career from there. So, Great. So, so your dad introduced you to the world of photography. Yeah. What kind of equipment were you using back then? Um, in comparison to what you're using now? Well, um, you know, of course, uh, film cameras. Uh, my first camera was a Pentax Spotmatic F. Spotmatic F, I think it was. Yep. Um, and, of course, I had all sorts of lenses accessible, you know, to me. And um, then I started getting into the large format cameras. He gave me a Hasselblad before I started college. So depending on the assignment. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, well, <clears throat> again, he had, you know, because he had access to all this stuff, he was able to get it for, you know, a song, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, when, you know, a lot of the equipment that he had was uh, stuff that he actually, you know, got from, McDonnell Douglas, because as soon as the Apollo missions ended, they would, th they were throwing away all this valuable equipment, and they would just park a, a, a roll off at the loading dock at the facility and just chuck lenses and tripods and high speed cameras into this roll off and just cart it off to the dump. So he uh, he created 
a false bottom to his station wagon and filled it up with equipment and, um, you know, would drive past the guard with all this equipment that he, he just couldn't let it go. He couldn't, couldn't see it being, you know, carted off to the dump. So, um, that's, that's where I was able to get all this equipment from. You are blowing my mind. I can't believe somebody would throw away <clears throat> such great equipment. Well, I mean, that's the way it was. It's, there was so much money being thrown at that, that cause. And, and that's why he was able to develop that, that particular department in McDonnell Douglas. He, they came to him and said, what can you do for us? And he said, well, I can do this. And they said, great, make it happen. Yeah. So he would do things like um, they would go out to the desert and they, the, the company would mount a rocket engine out in the middle of the desert and they would take the fuselage off and they would, my father and his partner would surround it with different cameras, high speed, uh, motion, uh, infrared, you know, loaded with infrared film, all sorts of, and they would just surround it with cameras and they would, you know, turn on the engine and they would photograph it and then they would take that film and, and analyze it for six months to see if there's any you know problems with the rocket engine I mean, he did stuff like that um, his big claim to fame was uh, that he helped design the shot of the Saturn stages uh, Saturn rocket stages so I don't know if you've seen this before you probably have it's it's always on Discover or National Geographic where this, the stages from the Saturn rocket separate and there's yeah. a lot of fire that happens and then the, the Earth in the background, he helped design that shot. Oh, and the, solution, the solution was eight inches of optically clear quartz that isolated the camera or, um, from, the, from the rocket engines. That's amazing. So, yeah. So do you consider yourself more... A commercial photographer or an art photographer because I looked at your work and it's just amazing and there's this just great look to it but then there's this heavy I want to say in some of the pictures there's a heavy surreal element mm. to some of those pictures um, could you talk about that um, well that's funny that's a very good question actually um, I've been told by many people, my work rides the the razor's edge between art and commerce, and um, primarily, I from all the way up until this point, I consider myself a commercial photographer. Um, I mean, I've had gallery, I've had galleries represent me before. Um, I'm just actually talking to someone right now about that, um, but I think right now I'm at a I'm at a turning point in my career where I, where I want to concentrate on fine artwork. Um, most of that comes from doing personal projects. Mm -hmm. Now I think that's what I want to really focus on right at this moment. So how do those galleries that you're working with, how do they find you initially? How does, how does that process work? Well, it's all about relationships, you know, so uh, either they've seen my work before or I have approached them. Right now the person I'm talking to is Kathleen Clark who is a photo editor for LA Times, um, Los Angeles, not no, Los Angeles Magazine and we worked on a few projects together. She opened up a gallery uh, a few years ago and I was the um, inaugural show of that new gallery. Um, now she's opened up another gallery um, called Spot in Los Angeles, and we're talking about, you know, me being a part of that group. Um, so relationships, basically. But you know, I've been around a long time, and my work has been around a long time, and so people know me and they know my work. So I think that's how that works. And again, it's all about relationships. So, so in terms of your process, could you tell us a little bit about what goes? behind that, the planning, and um, from uh, up until you, you start shooting? Okay. Uh, so on a, a, con a commissioned work, usually 
you know, I'll talk about the editorial side of it because that's where I have more of a thumbprint on the work than advertising. But they'll come to me with a manuscript that I'll read. It's either a fiction or nonfiction story. Um, and we'll talk about uh, illustrating certain points in that story. And from there, I will come up with an idea that I'll sketch out and send sketches to the photo editor. And then she, he or she will make changes if necessary. Um, and then from there, I will take those sketches and um, plan my shoot. I'm actually planning during the sketching phase of how things are going to unfold. Um, so, and then from there, I do the execution. And most, and then what's involved after that is usually set design, prop fabrication. At that point, point. Um, and do you, do you create your own props? I do. I do a lot of my own propping right now. And um, I mean, I've, I've done that all the time. You know, I work with my assistants. We build the sets. We make the props. Um, if I need to, I'll have something fabricated, um, and I have a whole army of people that I've worked with in the past that uh, I turn to to help me with the project, and then we'll execute it. And I try to keep uh, the work uh, with, I, I try to plan my work in a way that I'm doing as little Photoshop as possible. I try to do it that way. Um, but sometimes I have to I have to work with Photoshop almost exclusively, you know, depending on the execution and the concept. So, um, great. Yeah. So, what would you say is primarily different from your process when you create your work from other typical photographers or photographers that just do? straight commercial work and they don't have that heavy artistic element to the work? I'm not really sure. You know, the funny thing is I don't really look at a lot of photography as far as inspiration is concerned. I don't know. The one thing that I've, I've discovered or, or have been reminded of is that, uh, you know, when I try to do work, when I, try to, when I do work to try to get jobs, it usually doesn't work out for me. If, it, if I'm doing creating work that's pure and from the heart, that's when it usually works out. If I'm trying to, if I'm looking at other examples of photography or advertising or uh, different concepts and I use that as a springboard for my inspiration, it just doesn't work out for me. So, um, you know, as far as the difference between what they do and what I do, you know, I wouldn't be able to tell you that, really. Um, I just, I'm just following the process that works for me, and um, and sometimes it looks like it's done in Photoshop, and then I'll surprise someone by saying, no, it's all done in front of the camera. Um, but that's a process that works for me. That's just the so way then, I think. If, if it's all done in front of a camera, there must be a lot of planning that, that goes behind that, and and you must really know your concept really well to get the effects that that you get. I saw some of your pictures in your archive one, mm -hmm. I think it is, and you know there there are pictures where there's smoke and it it's covering this guy's face, or there's there's a tree and it's it's that guy's head. It looks like. I mean, is is that all done just through planning? Yeah, yeah, I would say that's, you know, I, the reason why I sketch, I sketch very in detailed, as detailed as possible. Um, proportions, um, size relationships are all pre-planned in this sketch. And then that is a blueprint for the way the, the execution of the image will, you know, unfold. So <clears throat> while I'm sketching, I'm planning how things are going to work together. And the way things work together is based on experience from before. There's, you know, there's a lot of imagery that doesn't work that you don't see. Mm -hmm. uh, you're seeing the stuff that does work. 
but through trial and error and a lot of mistakes and um, you know experience, um, I've come up with these techniques that I use. I still employ a lot of them, a lot of collage, a lot of assemblage. So um, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, that was that was great. You said that you sort of wanted to start getting more into the fine art aspect of things and started to starting to do more gallery shows. Mm -hmm. um, like, where do you get the concepts and the storytelling elements for your ideas for those? Because those aren't necessarily commissioned, right? It, it's no. those are your own ideas, and so wh where does that come from? Uh, that's that's a great question. Um, I think they're like a culmination of different uh, different lights, different um, imagery that or artwork, you know, different different styles of artwork that inspire me. Right now, I'm working on a series of shadow boxes. They're not necessarily inspired by Joseph Cornell's work, but they're, they, the structures are in themselves shadow boxes. And, um, but they're going to be different than what Joseph Cornell did. Um, uh, and the, the reason why I'm going that way is just because I like, I seem to have discovered that I like contained little worlds that I, um, you know, vignettes, let's say. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm going in that direction. As far as like the themes are concerned, they're all going to be different. They're all going to be completely different from one another. But um, they're all the, the. I guess the common theme is the fact that they're going to be, you know, shadow or constructed in a similar way. They're going to be like the first one I am finishing up next week. Basically, is a shadow box that's about 20 by 24 inches. But the idea is the future concepts that I have, the boxes themselves will be maybe 12 feet tall by 5 feet wide, so they're going to be larger scale. Some will be smaller, some will be in between that, those dimensions. So. Hugh, for, for those of us who don't know, what, what is a shadow box exactly? Shadow box, if, they, if your audience wants to Google Joseph Cornell, um, what he did is he collected uh, Illustrations, news clippings, little precious toys, um, objects that he put together in kind of a collage assemblage in these little boxes that it, wood boxes that he would make. And um, yeah, I, I don't know if, if he was the only artist that worked in that particular medium, but um, he was probably the most well known. And uh, I think the why, the reason why it's called a shadow box is when the light hits it, it creates a shadow. And there are different layers of objects put together, and each um, has its own, causes its own shadow on it, and it gives it kind of a three-dimensional look, but contained within this little world that he creates. So if you notice, some of my work that I've done in the past, um, they, they feel... Um, I could re refer a few pieces, but they feel like they are expansive in their perspective, uh -huh. but they're really contained in a small uh, area of depth, you know, um, in reality. But are I you, force, force a perspective a little bit through size relationship. Are you perhaps able to bring up some of that work right now? All right, so I've got what I'm talking about here. Can you see, see that it. at all? Yeah, I see it. Okay. So this, let me see. So this is a personal project I did where I'm actually photographing these, this particular scene that I put together um, from above the floor of the studio basically, and they're lying on the floor. And this concept came about because of I was inspired. It's crazy how things work, how my mind works, but I saw a paper, a plastic bag caught 
in a tree in a park in Brooklyn, and that's was where this whole project initiated from. And I thought, how interesting would it be to see a man caught by his coat collar in a tree blowing in the wind? And when I originally thought of how to do it, I wanted to do it practically and actually get someone up into an actual tree in a park somewhere. But logistically and financially, it was going to be a problem. So I completely... Uh, twisted the, the concept around and wanted and shifted to this particular solution but, but then create this entire fanciful world around it, okay? So I, I, my approach now was to actually shoot them on the floor and create these, uh, these, fic, these fictitious, this fictitious world um, using all these props that I would make. And so they're lying on the floor. It's a very simple background that they're lying on. And I made the clouds and the, the little kites, let's say, over in the one on the left. And the, the, the grass area and where the little gnomes are and the, the picnic scene are all mounted to a wall that is coming up from the floor towards the camera. And... Uh, so she's, she is lying on the, her back is on the floor and her legs are up onto the wall. And he's just lying on the floor like that, just above her. And then the clouds are floating above the background and everything else is mounted to, hard to the, uh, to the wall itself. And I'm forcing the, the perspective a little bit by, by you know, these, solu these, these little solutions like the, the mountain scene itself is actually folded fabric that is, you know, redu you know, mounted to the floor, but gives it this force, this idea of forced perspective. So it's supposed to look like a little mountain scene in the background. That uh, is fantastic. I love this. And it's always really fun to put together. It took me about. Uh, it took about three weeks to prep for it. I did all the work myself with some help from an assistant, but um, these were all sketched out ahead of time, um, and this is what I came up with. The, on the right side is this other scene of these two people. You know, the whole the, the, the concept was uh, blustery day, and so there, these two people are taking advantage of this blustery day, and becoming these other objects. So that's what, that, that was the, the, the idea behind this. So for the ne next one, they're flags. They're, they're enjoying themselves as being flags. So, <laughs> so the, the ocean itself are photographs of ocean texture that I did. And I stitched the images together and then made these large mural-sized prints of them. And you know, that's an area, that wall is basically four feet, um, four to eight feet tall. That's coming up from the floor towards the camera. And I am through uh, the texture, the, the reduced texture in the background and the, the small uh, crest that I'm creating by cutting out the photographs um, is becoming... Uh, uh, I am forcing the perspective. So the in the foreground, closer to the camera, I am cutting using a larger texture of the ocean and then cutting a larger crest. So this forced perspective is actually contained within about four feet, but it looks a lot deeper by that way. Does that make any sense to you? Are the are the models on the floor in this picture, like in the previous shot, or they are they are on the floor. I had to have them, you know, uh, raise their feet a little bit, and I've I've actually distorted their um, their appendages a little bit to make them look more like they are bending with the with the breeds, let's say. But they're either there's a pillow or some sort of bolster that's underneath them to raise them up off the floor a little bit more than naturally. Um, and they're raising their feet a little bit. But 
but maintaining this, these expressions. So it was a little bit difficult to try to get them to look natural, to look comfortable um, while they're doing all this. Um, so it was, it was a lot of, we took a lot of time in shooting this, um, but basically it you know, was to get this particular effect. And then it was enhanced a little bit in Photoshop through a, like a, a liquid filter or whatever it may be that I'm using to, to bend them slightly. Um, and where are you as a photographer? Are you shooting above them then? or Because I know you said that they're on the floor. You're using the wall as sort of the perspective. I mean, how do you position yourself and your camera to get that shot? Well, the beauty of a Hasselblad, um, what is it, the H5 or whatever it is, is that you can preview through a video feed of what's taking place below the camera. You can actually focus the camera um, using the computer um, below. So I mounted the camera to, I think at this point, there was scaffolding that I constructed um, in the set. Um, Around around the set, actually, and the camera it's acting like basically like a huge tripod, and the camera's mounted to that, and then I'm running um, running it from a computer at the um, base where they are. So I'm instructing them over to the side, and then watching through this feed, um, and so once they get into the position, I change the option on the camera and then photograph them. That makes sense. That that does make sense. Yes. Yeah. How did you get the shadows underneath the full body? I see it's it's almost from the head to the to their feet. Uh, you mean in the one of, with the flags? Yeah. The flag. yeah. Well, that's enhanced. That's enhanced in Photoshop a little bit. So some of it is their own shadow, and then some of it's created. So it's a combination of of the two. So. I use, I, again, I try to do as little Photoshop as possible, and usually when I mimic in Photoshop what is actually there, then it works out pretty well. So it's a combination of their own natural shadow and created shadow in Photoshop. Okay. Does that make sense? If you shoot the scene all at once like that, and you do very little Photoshop. When you finally get to Photoshop, are you just working with one layer, or you still have to work with multiple layers to get the effects that you want? Well, multiple layers, because of course I shoot plates. You know that's necessary. Sometimes, and in the, that plate, you know, during that plate process, I'll move things around a little bit. You know, so they're out of the scene, but everything else is there. So. You know, if the cloud was over towards the middle, I'll shoot other plates to move it over off to the side because I'm not really sure how everything's going to unfold when I put it together in Photoshop. You know, I was knowing that I'm going to bend them slightly in Photoshop. You know, that particular plate may not work that I shot, so I shoot several different plates and might have to, you know, use a different plate. So with the clouds moved in different areas or the little birds that I created out of paper and whatnot. So, um, and this is an extreme wide angle lens. So I'm not sure what it was. I think it was a 35 millimeter lens that I used for that. Um, because the, the camera itself is about 16 feet above the set. And that set is probably about 12 feet tall, if not more. Does that make sense? That so, does make sense. Yeah, from the top of the from the top of the image to the base, it's about 14 feet. About 14 feet. So where do you shoot? Do you have your own studio? Do you rent studios? Rent studios. I have a little place I share with a, an old assistant of mine. He owns it down in City of Industry, and that's where I shoot out of mostly these days. So, but for this case, I um, I have a friend who owned a studio in Culver City, and I used hers. So, and for for those of us who don't know, uh, what is the concept behind shooting plates? Well, it because um, you never know what's going to happen in Photoshop. I mean, I can pre-plan this till to the end, but you know, there's three different 
evolutions of an idea. One is this, the, the initial idea, then it's the sketch, then it's the photography, or I guess there's four evolutions, and then, the, and then when it goes through post-production. So to cover myself, I shoot blank, what they call plates, which I'm not really sure why they use that terminology, because plates were actually glass negatives that they would use, but they call it plates. Um, so basically, so I'll cover myself after they move out of the set, I'll shoot different uh, plates of different elements um, moved around, and then I'll remove, um, you know, I'll begin to remove those elements and bring it down to the to the bare background, uh, and I'll have that those plates to help me construct it in Photoshop. So instead of trying to, you know, and that gives me um, more options and a better result at the end, instead of trying to clone things and move things around uh, just on the existing image. Okay, so it just enables me to get a better result at the end. Does that make any sense? Yes. Yeah. Right. So, so how, how about the colors in your pictures? I realize they're very vibrant. How did you come up with those, and did you come up with all those beforehand? Well, I, um, I didn't uh, pre-visualize it as being brightly colored, although through that evolution, working with the fashion stylist, she came up with this color palette that was very bright and cheery, and as we, as we worked together, I realized that it, I, wanted, I wanted it to be a little bit, um, a little bit unreal, so, and brightly colored and almost, you know, child uh, book story, you know, so, you know, some of my inspiration actually comes from uh, children's books that I used to read to my daughter when she was young, and this might be some sort of influence from those storybooks. And so I wanted, you know, as she showed me the fashions, I realized that maybe by brightening up the colors a little bit, it'll give it more of that storybook quality. So I pushed the, I think at this time they didn't have vibrancy on as a tool or a filter um, or as a, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, as an option. So I used just pushed uh, the um, hue saturation on it a little bit, just a little bit. But most of the fashions themselves are really brightly colored. I do see that storybook element that yeah. you're talking about. Nice. Okay. Well, thank you. Is there any other work you'd like to share that you're you're currently working on or excited about, or we can? Uh, I mean, you want to talk about some of the collage stuff? Let's see. Let's see, see, see. Well, this one. Oh. I, I like to use photographs. Hold on, let me see if I can get another one. I'm going to archive two. Let's see what's there. Where did you come up with like that picture of the guy with a with a tree for the head? Where did you come up with that concept? That I it was it actually was... that was a commission piece. It's um, I think that the article was about productivity, and you know the concept for me was getting lost in work, and um, so. That's where, you know, like getting lost in a forest, I think, you know, it's like one idea, you know, stimulates another idea and then unfolds to the actual idea. So lost in work, lost in a forest, lost in the trees, and that's where this idea came from. So um, that's what the title of this particular piece is, Lost in Work. Great. How about the photo right next to it? How did you do that? Oh, that's, that's that looks amazing. amazing. I worked with a great uh, photo editor um, for Bloomberg Wealth Manager magazine. Uh, her name was Laura Zavitz. It is Laura Zavitz. I don't know if she. I don't think she works for that magazine anymore. But she was great because she gave me a lot of, a lot of carte blanche when it comes to these assignments. And this was a 
part of a series that I did for her, uh, an article on growth, growing your portfolio. And I had different, uh, different concepts related to growth, and this was one of them. And she just said, go for it. And I worked with a great makeup artist, um, Jane Choi. I worked with her a lot in New York. And so she, we found this, <laughs> this willing model. There's an actual person underneath her. It's not a mannequin. <laughs> and uh, who had red hair. Um, actually, none of that is her own hair, to be honest. That's all hair extensions that uh, Jane attached to her um, from the back. And for seven and a half hours, she applied these hair extensions to her body. Seven and a half hours, and about five cans of hairspray um, for this one shot. The wow. bottle didn't make uh, didn't talk, and she didn't need to use the restroom during that entire time. She just stood patiently and, and had this applied to her. And we brought her into the set, and for ten minutes, I racked off a few rolls of film. She would not allow me to light the cigarette on her because she had so much hairspray. She was afraid she was going to explode. Um, <laughs> I, and then I just retouched. I just put the cigarette in her mouth and then retouched the smoke in uh, a little bit later. Um, but that was that's how that unfolded. So um, so it's all there. It's all there. Great. Yeah. Great. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to sidetrack you. Were you were you going to no, show us okay. some of the it's all right. Blood? So here's here's a let's see the one on the right here was one of the first images I did where I'm using a combination of collage and assemblage. So I photographed this is my assistant, and I photographed him just like that, and he made we made these big prints, 30 by 40 size prints of that particular image. And then I cut the image, cut the face out of the image, and um, you know the outline of his um, suit basically. And then behind the the collar of the suit or the collar of his shirt, I put a little ledge of foam core attached to the photograph, and I stacked those bills that those stacks of money on it. And then mounted the the face itself, photograph of the face, the cutout photograph of the face to that with a piece of string, and then rephotographed it with a four by five camera. Okay, and then the lighting on the assemblage matches the lighting on him, so the, that increases the chance of the illusion working well. It's by following the the lighting that I originally worked. Right. Was that commissioned or was that your own idea? It was, it was actually a call for uh, to create a calendar at the turn of the century, basically. Um, we were to take uh, the whole group, uh, my agent, his group, uh, had to illustrate three different themes or phrases, words from the 20th century. And this was materialism. That was so. That's what I illustrated here. Uh, let's see something else. So this one on the right of the Pinocchio nose was also done in that technique. So, and it's actually if you look at it off to the side. It's a very crude assemblage, but from this perspective, it has a three-dimensional quality to it. But it's a two-dimensional photograph that's cut out. And mounted to the wall. And again, this is all pre planned during the sketching phase of how this is going to work. So I know that I'm going by way of the, of the sketch, I know how the execution is going to work. I wanted to have the camera's perspective that's actually on the, the cutout photograph to be looking down this piece of plywood that's the background and to give it a little bit of depth. Um, but I had to actually assemble it in front of the camera to, to in a way that 
that made this illusion work. So the string is attached to the mask over here. Mm -hmm. but the string is actually attached to something else back there, but in the line of the camera, the, the picture-taking camera, on the final set, it makes it look like it's attached to the other side of the mask when it really isn't. And the, the illusion is complete by this little extra piece back here, right above his left eye, that I use to make it look like it's three-dimensional. It's just attached in the back side. And I use a 4x5 camera um, all throughout the entire process. And then through a tilt and shift um, move, um, decrease the depth of field to give it a little bit more of depth and, uh, um, you know, completing the illusion, basically. How about the shadows in there? Or were there, was that natural from the 2D cutout, or did you have to enhance those somehow? No, it's all there. Um, again, it's, you know, it's about pre-planning. I knew that if I, if I, when I photographed him with the, with the prosthetic nose on, um, I wanted to light it in a certain way that would make the final, you know, shadow work together. So the direction of the light that's hitting him is for this final um, collage and assemblage. Okay, so I'm pre-planning all that. All right, so the lighting, I'm planning the lighting on him so that the lighting on the mask works together in conjunction with the set. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, it does. All Great. Right. All three plan. All right. So what kind of lighting do you typically use for these? And, and like, for example, that photo with a 2D mask, how did you set up the lighting around it? Okay, so it's one. I, I work with a lot of very old equipment. I have this beauty dish uh, on a Speedatron that I just love. Um, it has a really great quality of light. And that's primarily what I used on him. Um, but the on the collage itself, it's a it's basically a seven inch reflector with a grid spot and some um, tough spun between the grid spot and the light itself. And I wanted it. I wanted to use a narrow source to give a little bit of a natural vignette to it, so that you can isolate. So I wanted to isolate the light onto the mask itself. So again, that's all pre-planned. That's exactly what I wanted to use. So the quality of light is pretty similar from the light that's hitting him initially to the way the way it ends up on the collage itself. And I, the lighting, my lighting scheme is pretty simple. I try not to complicate things with multiple lights, although I have in the past um, done, done that. Um, in this case, a lot of the, these cases, it's very simple lighting. Usually with this 20-inch um, reflector, um, usually it's one source or two, a fill light um, that's hitting him. So usually it's about two lights. It's hard for me to believe that the 2D cutout, I, it's almost, I can almost feel the textures popping off the face. Yeah, I, I photographed him with a 4x5 camera too um, because I, through trial and error I was doing this technique with a medium format camera initially and the grain from the uh, negative was, didn't work really well when translating that to 4x5. So I switched to 4x5 throughout the entire process with this particular shot, and it worked out really well. And what kind of printer do you use to print out these 2D cutouts? Well, well these are done um, in wet process. This is, this is working with um, neg film and uh, type C printing. And <clears throat> I'll, you know, Back when, when I was working with uh, the wet processes, I would print these myself. Okay, so, I, so you, have, you have your own print studio. Set well, I know. I would, rent a, I would rent a spot at um, one of the local labs while I was living in New York. This was done in New York. So there were an array of different you know, labs you could rent a space in and, a, and enlarger. 
and there would be a common creonite machine that you would run your prints through. And the other thing is that because the contrast increases from, you know, from the initial photography to the collage, I'd have to light it a certain way. The ratios would be closer between the fill light and the key light. Um, and that would translate to, you know, by the time I printed it and then rephotographed it, the contrast would increase on the print itself. So I'd have to light it a little bit more close in ratio initially. I don't know if that's 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 probably helpful. Hopefully, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah. it does. Thank you. I wanted to move into talking about who you feel are your influences, inspiration, maybe other artists or books, movies, music. Huh. That's a really good question. Uh, and you know what? Let's let's we can stop sharing your screen at this point. So we okay. can go back to you. Yep. Thank you oh, for that. Right. Yeah. Great. Okay. So yes, yeah, so Hugh, who who would you say are your influences? Where do you get your inspiration from? That's a really big question. <clears throat> when I started my career, I soon out of art school. I realized that my portfolio looked like everyone else's out of out of school. Okay, I'd go to an art director and he'd thumb through my portfolio and he would say, You're, "You went to art center." That's how revealing my portfolio was. And I, I after that point, I discovered that I was trying to fit my work into what everyone else was doing and struggling to try to gain, you know, to get work with that portfolio because the people that were actually doing that work had already established these relationships with these art directors. So I had to come up with, you know, a different way of doing things. And again, it was like at that point, that was a turning point in my career where I had to come up with some something else. And I actually attended a seminar by Ian Summers who told the audience, shoot from the heart, and the money will come. Shoot what you love and the money will come. And I took that with, with vigor and I searched deep on what do I really love. And I, coming from a family of artists, my mother used to dapple in all sorts of media. My sister is a fine, art, uh, fine artist in New York. That there were all these art history books and museum catalogs in my mother's library. And I, I pulled a bunch of them out and I started thumbing through them and I realized that I really love 20th century art, especially the Dada movement, um, Russian constructivism, surrealism. And so at that time, I took that information, that love, of that type of work, and I began to create work centered around that. So I, I did these collage still lifes that were very time consuming and involved and put myself in the studio and just created work centered around that. And at that same time, uh, I met my agent who um, really liked the work that I was creating and we slowly began to get work based on that, those collages that I put together. No one else was doing them. And that's when I started my career at that point. And so today, that inspiration comes from all sorts of different places, but what I look at primarily is illustration, uh, artwork mostly, not so much photography. Um, and you know, I've got a Pinterest board, and that's basically you know a lot of that that stuff. I also uh, art director gave me the uh, web link. Um, I don't know if you know it. I think it's uh, it's called Found, but it's 4FsOund.com. No, I, I haven't. Yeah, let me see if I can open up another window and see if I can actually get it. All right, hold on one second. Okay. It's 4FsOund.com. Okay. 
All right. Well, you look that up. Yeah. And it's you have to be invited to actually contribute work to it, but I find a lot of uh, inspiration from there. And it's all sorts of design and you know imagery that people who are invited to this particular website post. <laughs> And uh, lately, that's where I've been getting a lot of my inspiration. You know? Okay. Another, other sources are going to galleries and museums. That's where I really find myself getting inspired. You know? And I don't know where the inspiration comes from. It's sometimes it's it's inspired by you know just a detail of a of a painting or an illustration or a piece of paper I find on the street. But that's where I, you know, that's where the ideas stem from. Basically. Great, great. How about any? How about media? Any music or books that in particularly inspire you? It, it always interests me to to learn what ar other artists like to to read or what they like to listen to or, or the kind of movies that they like to watch. <laughs> I love sci-fi, especially good sci-fi. Uh, Blade Runner is a uh, one of my. It is, it is my favorite film of all time. I've seen it hundreds of times. Um, that actually, that particular film inspired a series I did uh, called Gastronopolis, which I did back in the '90s. Um, right. That was also inspired by much the film Metropolis and um, Silent Film, um, Silent Sci-Fi Film. Uh, children's books, you know, are influence. Music-wise, you know, I do get a lot of, you know, when I'm in a, in a place of calm and I'm really focusing on the music, um, I, when I listen to certain music, imagery comes up in my mind. Whether music itself influences my work, I'm not sure. I think music kind of nurtures the work. Um, Philip Glass is a. I'm a huge fan of Philip Glass's. Love Philip Glass. Yeah. yeah, and that's where I get a lot of inspiration, too. So, um, if it's a direct connection, I'm not really sure. But um, usually, it's you know, compositions um, from uh, you know classical music sometimes. So, great. Yeah. So what piece of advice do you wish somebody gave you when you first started out? I know you said that one of your, or somebody said to follow your heart and, and just keep following your heart and create the, the kind of work that, that you love. Is there anything else that you wish somebody else imparted to you or any words of advice or wisdom to, to new artists? I think that, I mean, I... I don't think uh, I'm, you know, I, I can, I can look back and I'm looking back now and saying I'm I'm very lucky to have had the career and the time that I actually had it because I've been I've worked from working with film and web processes that have translated through digital processing and post production. Um, to the work that I do now. Um, I'm happy for that because one has been a springboard for another that, that actually I'm work, you know, creating work that's from that history. Um, but the, I, think, I don't think there's anything that I'm missing or wish someone told me beforehand, honestly. But I seem to be going back to that same philosophy where, you know, shooting from the heart is where that's where I do my best work. Um, trying to do anything else, trying to fit my work into someone else's look or, or anything else is, is not something I would recommend anybody to do. Mm -hmm. To find your own voice, you know, discover your own sensibilities and work from there. So then, when you go ahead. when you first started, were you making money from your photography right away, just just doing the things that you loved, or did you do that full time, or 
Well, what's the story? Um, well, that's, that's, a, that's a really that's a good question. Um, during that time when I was creating that work that I talked about earlier, these collage assemblages, still lights, it was a very lean time. But slowly but surely, um, I started getting work. My first job with that style was a pro bono job for the San Francisco AIDS Foundation annual report. And they covered my expenses, but I donated my time. And that illustration went, uh, was received an award through Communication Arts, the design annual. And then be slowly but surely, people began to notice it. And then slowly but surely, I got commissioned work. I did it album cover, I did something for um, a and Records, and then most of the work that I was creating at that time was for editorial. I really wasn't doing any advertising. And um, I, I made a living at it. And then when I moved to New York, um, I began to see that that particular style of work had a short lifespan. It was, gonna, it was not going to work out for me. And again, I did create my own personal work based on you know, things that I loved. And then that, my look at my work changed, the, the content of my work changed, and then I was getting work from that. So whenever I go back to that, you know, that philosophy, it always seemed to have worked out for me. Um, trying to do anything else has not been productive at all. So, um, that's what I can instill to your audience. Follow yeah. that. Follow that part. Did you start in L.A. and then you moved to New York for work? I moved to New York because I met my uh, then girlfriend, then wife, um, who was actually going to move to New York to open up an office for her company. I visited New York several times and wanted to wanted to move, uh, but she. You know, she was a stimulant that actually um, I followed and made that happen. At the time, I was teaching at Art Center. I had established my career here. I had a studio in downtown LA and was doing pretty well. Um, but New York had always been in my uh, crosshairs, and I wanted to, to move there. So, so what brought you back to Los Angeles? I uh, lifestyle, I think, basically. Um, it was a choice that we made as a family. We wanted to raise our kid in a, in a different climate. Um, you know, my, my, my wife at the time had a little bit of a struggle with New York for, for a while. And uh, we just thought maybe change would help. And um, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I've experienced it. But I don't know if L.A. is going to be my permanent spot. Thinking when my daughter gets out of high school, I might try another city. Where I'm not really sure yet. Maybe New York again, maybe San Francisco, um, but someplace else I think. You know? Right. Okay. So, do you have any upcoming shows or plans that you'd like to share with us? Well, I'm uh, creating this body of work right now, uh, shadow boxes, um, one image at a time. That's all I can do. It's, they're very involved very uh, you know, production heavy. So one by one I'll be um, executing those. Um, there is talk of a show at my friend Kathleen Clark's gallery when that work is completed. Um, I also want to create or script out a, an idea for a stop motion animation piece that uh, I want to get funded for and hopefully be able to produce hopefully next year. Um, but uh, that's, you know, this is all new, the, my approach to doing fine artwork. So I'm just at the beginning stages of that. So we'll see how it unfolds. Exciting. Ah, it is. Very exciting. So tell our viewers where they can find you, Twitter handles or Facebook, your website. Well, I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook, Hugh Kretschmer. Um, it's Facebook slash Hugh Kretschmer dot com, I guess. I'm also on Instagram under my same, that same name, Hugh Kretschmer. Um, Twitter, I'm not really a big tweeter, but uh, those two particular platforms are what I really follow or, or work with. Tumblr is also, I do a little bit of blogging too. 
then they can look me up on Tumblr. Yeah, thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. And okay. I want to I want to thank our viewers for tuning in. And you heard Hugh's website information. Please check him out. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank okay. you, Rob. That's our show for today. Thank you for tuning in. And if you have any questions, be sure to send me an email or visit our site at makephotoart.com.